All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let's see here. A few things. I do have some homework to give back to you, so let me do that. Okay, um, I will have the uh, solutions available for you um, later today. Uh, I'll get those probably by this evening sometime. I'll, I'll have those all out there for you. Um, I, I guess looking at the homeworks, um, I think it overall went okay. Um, there was a um, there was a problem dealing with um, flooding in a column, and then um, changing the pressure and seeing what happens to it and so on. You need to make another assumption in there, and and um, I saw several of you made different assumptions there. Um, the assumption is either the volumetric flow rates remain the same or the mass flow rates remain the same and you get very different answers depending upon which assumption you make um, i took i took both but i kind of think that i think you can make an argument for the mass flow rates being constant rather than the volumetric flow rates being constant but um but i just wanted to point that out was something to think about um, there was a problem. Let's see, what was another problem that um, I noticed some difficulties with? Um, the problem with sizing a column. Um, That one seemed to give some difficulties um, in, in terms of just get coming up with the right values, paying attention to it. There's a lot of calculations to do for that problem. Um, and also making sure that you were sizing it for the appropriate part of the column as well. Um, just one to make note of or pay attention to a little bit. Um, like I said, I'll have those solutions out to you later today. Um, let me um, just ask in general, are there some, any questions anybody has on the homeworks or anything in particular? You get the solutions, you can look over them a little bit more as well. Um, okay. Next homeworks due a week from today. Okay. Um, Wednesday is the exam, right? What's it going to cover? Right, which means chapters 5, 7, 10, and 12, right? So what was chapter 5? Multi-component distillation, that's where we introduce the idea of keys, right? Heavy keys, light keys, um, and then uh, ones which were either beyond those, um, heavy non-keys, light non-keys, and so on. And then uh, chapter seven was 
multi-component method using shortcuts using FUG method, right? Stands for F Gilliland. Fenske, Underwood, and Gilliland, yes. Um, and so what, what at all did we do? The Fenske method gave us what? Does it give you the actual number of stages or the minimum number of stages? Minimum number of stages, right? And then we use the Underwood method to come up with minimum leaf flux ratio. Then if you know what the actual is in terms of that, then you can start to calculate what? the actual number of stages, right? And then we use the Gillen method to you know, looking at feed stages. Well, actually, feed stage was partly, it, it's kind of wrapped up together. There was also the Kirkbride method as well for the feed stages, okay? Um, Chapter 10, what did we do? Well, it was, it was columns with either trays or packed columns, right? And it was doing analysis um, oftentimes to do some sizing of those, correct? Okay. Chapter 12 was? Absorption and stripping, right? Um, and how did we solve those problems? A lot of the problems were design problems, right? So we wanted to figure out, you know, how many how many stages do we need in order to carry out the separations? What what methods did we use there? We used McCabe Teeley, right? We were able to convert to McCabe Teeley. What else did we use? What is it? Kremser equation. Yeah, Kremser equation, right? Okay. Um, so, so we looked at various analyses there. We also looked at cases where maybe it was more concentrated or less concentrated, and how to how to do those kinds of problems. Okay. So that's pretty much what we've what we've covered, um, and that's the topics that'll end up being on the exam. Um, we should probably talk about the exam, shouldn't we? Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Um, let's see here. I in, I think the exam's going to be probably three problems, I think. Um, so as we went through and we talked about the topics that we've covered there, I could see problems kind of being pulled from sort of each of those sort of broad areas. Um, so, so we'd certainly know how to do the problems we did in class, know how to do the homework problems, and uh, I think that should set you up pretty well for the exam. Um, we'll try for some as much time, extra time as we can give you. So we'll uh, we'll start five minutes early, if we, like we did last time. Um, what can you use for the exam? Everything, everything but, yeah, the internet and your friends, right? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Um, certainly have some, some sort of straight edge with you, too, uh, probably. Calculator. Yeah. Any questions anybody think of about for the exam?
everybody knows what you want to study then pretty well. Okay. Yeah, and with the homework solutions out there too, you can look look those over too if you have some questions about, about anything coming up. Okay. All right. Um, well, then let's um, let's jump back into um, liquid liquid extraction. I think that's what we're going to do today. We'll probably, I think, try to kind of wrap that up, and we'll call it a day with liquid liquid extraction. We'll do the we'll have the exam on Wednesday, Friday, and Monday. We'll take a look at chapter 14 or some parts of it, and talk about the final. Okay, we'll kind of wrap things up there a bit probably assign you one more problem in chapter 14 but you that would be one you can do on your own I think I won't collect it okay. all right so let's um let's take a look then at kind of where we left off um, I think this is where we stopped last time we um, we gone through we'd, we'd looked at um, Kremser method for dilute systems, um, and then we, we we left off, I think, talking just briefly about um, if you have a concentrated uh, system, and we can define instead of mole fractions, we can define ratios. So that would be something like ratio of the solute to the diluent, or ratio of the solute to the solvent. Um, and so basically redefining our system in terms of those parameters, those quantities, um, we can go ahead and, um, and, and do our analysis like we would with a McCabe-Dealey plot. Right? So that means plotting an equilibrium line based upon these capitalized um, variables and also um, looking at the operating line in terms of these capitalized variables. Um, derivation of that operating line is exactly the same as what we did before in terms of mole fractions. Okay, no, no difference there. Um, I had thought about going through that one, but I think, I think we'll go ahead and maybe skip that and we'll go on and take a look at maybe an example with this, okay? So that gets us into last part of chapter 13 for us. And I think what we'll do is we'll take a look at, um, at this example, go through some aspects of it. Um, so, so here's a case where we're going to come in with um, a stream of water, let's say 1300, I think I'm missing a unit here for time, uh, kilograms per hour, let's say. Um, 120 kilograms per hour, let's say, of water stream contains 21.3 weight percent pyridine, and that's going to be extracted with chlorobenzene at one atmosphere and 25 degrees C in a countercurrent liquid liquid extraction system. Um, the exiting raffinate stream is desired to have 1.5 weight percent pyridine. The chlorobenzene stream that comes in already has 0.4 weight percent pyridine in it. And we're told here that the solvent flow rate is one and a half times the minimum flow rate. And our question is then how many stages are required for this? Okay. All right, so let's just kind of briefly remind ourselves here what some of these uh, materials look like. Um, pyridine, right, aromatic ring except we substitute nitrogen for carbon, right? Um, and then chlorobenzene, we just add a chlorine onto our benzene ring, okay? All right, so along with this problem, we're given some equilibrium data. And the equilibrium data are given in this table. Um, some of it's for the extract and some of it's for the raffinate. And you'll see here that we're essentially given, let's say, weight fractions um, of the pyridine and the water, in this case. 
um, which means that we could always calculate um, the amount of chlorobenzene in, in either one of these, right? Since we only have three components, we can always figure out what that is. I guess we have to ask ourselves some questions about this. Um, one of the questions that we have to sort of address here is how do we approach the analysis? And, and so one of the things I think maybe we should be somewhat concerned about or, or thinking about is what's the miscibility of, let's say, our diluent and our solvent in this case, right? Because most of the time we've been considering systems at least it's a little bit easier for us to consider systems in which they're immiscible. So probably one of the first things we should do is take this data and, and look at that and examine it and see, see what the situation is. Um, in this problem, right, we've got um, let's say here, streams that consist of 21 weight percent pyridine. That's a pretty concentrated stream in the water, right? So let's, let's take a look at, if we consider something like this, let's consider maybe what happens in the raffinate stream. The raffinate stream is our water or chlorobenzene stream. It's a water stream, right? The raffinate contains the stream with the most diluent in it, right? It's going through it, okay? Um, so we know that it can contain up to 0.21 weight percent pyridine. Why don't we take a look at that case here? So here's a case right here. That's kind of at least one that bounds it for us, right? Okay. Let's look at that case and let's look at this case up here. Um, right away, given these two, let's say, weight fractions, we can go ahead and evaluate, say, something like for the chlorobenzene, right? And so down here, if you sum these up, right, subtract it from one, we get a value here of point. 0.058. And at the lowest, or with zero pyridine concentration in it, we had 0 0.0008. Is that big or small? Well, the numbers look small, but we, probably what we ought to do is maybe put it on a little bit different basis. How about we look at the amount of, let's say, chlorobenzene to water ratio in both of these cases? All right, so, so up here in this first case, we would have 0 0.008, and that would be divided by 0 0.9992. That would give us a direct ratio of those two. And so that's still going to come out to be 0. I think I'm missing a 0. 0, 0, 0, 008. And then for this case down here, we had 0 0.0058, and that's divided by, in this case, 0 0.7392. And that comes out to be 0 0.0078. So, so basically, while we're doing this extraction, we're seeing this ratio range from about 0.08 weight percent or percent let's just say we shouldn't say weight percent because it's really a ratio 0.08 percent um, to 0.78 percent not a big change there's there's definitely going to be a, a little bit of a change but not a huge change how about going the other way how about the water going into the um, chlorobenzene 
Well, what we should do then is take a look at the extract stream and do something similar to it over here. So for the extract stream over here, right? Um, let's say we've got y sub c. Um, this one's going to have 0 0.9995. And let's say if we do somewhere down in the same vicinity down here, this would give us 0 0.6915. And let's do the same things for, for it. So we would have, um, in the low end, we'd have 0 0.0005, 0 0.9995. And that's essentially gives us 0 0.0005. And then on the higher end, we would have 0 0.0225 divided by 0 0.6915. And that gives us 0 0.0325. And that's a little bit bigger change. But notice what happens here. Um, we're going to expect that there's a certain amount of water going into the chlorobenzene and a certain amount of chlorobenzene going into the water um, as we go along. Those are probably somewhat offsetting to each other for this case. I, again, not a huge amount, let's say, uh, uptake of water here into the chlorobenzene, but some. It's, it's, it's some. So for our problem then, on this basis, at least as a first pass, we will assume constant diluent and solvent flows. Not 100% true, but reasonable, reasonable force, okay? All right. Um, so just ask yourselves again, is this a dilute or a concentrated system that we're treating? What's the solute in this problem? Pyridine, right? Pyridine, we're trying to pull out of the water into the chloroform, or the uh, benzene, or excuse me, the chlorobenzene, right? So, it's pretty high weight percents. It's concentrated. So that means that we're going to have to probably um, use ratios instead of mole fractions to solve the problem. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, I've gone ahead here and put in a table. Um, did a couple of different calculations. We're going to use some of this. So basically what's been done here is we have taken essentially the, this is over here, what, the raffinate, right? And this is the extract uh, equilibrium data. Um, added a column to pick up the remaining component in each of those that wasn't in there originally. And then what we've done is we've calculated the capital X value for the pyridine. This capital X for the pyridine here is the way that we would have done this in the past in kind of a simple way. So this is really something like X of P over 1 minus X of P. In the same way over here, this is really Y sub P over 1 minus Y sub P. But in both of these cases, since we have some miscibility, a little bit of miscibility between the, the water and the chlorobenzene, we could do it on a basis then solely, let's say for a raffinate, look at the ratio of the pyridine to the water directly and see what it is. So this column here essentially represents X of P over X of W. And this column over here essentially represents y sub p over y sub c. And you can see there, there is a little bit of difference here. 
particularly as you get to some of the, uh, the higher concentrations. Um, but it's fairly close over a lot of the range for us. All right, so for us to solve the rest of the problem, we're gonna do it using the basis of just the x sub p's, okay? So that means that we're gonna do it assuming kind of this uh, uh, constant um, flow rates um, associated with, say, our um, diluent and solvent streams. All right, what do we do next? We've got the equilibrium data. Obviously, we can make a plot of that now, right? What, what plot are we going to make? Huh? Yeah, Cape, Cape Tealy, but what are we going to plot on it? You're right. We're going to plot, which of these columns are we going to plot on it? Yeah, just the just the just the ones only. So we're gonna plot capital Y sub P versus X sub P, right? Okay. All right. What else do we need? We know something about some of the concentrations coming in and out, right? At least initially, we need to put those in terms of these ratio quantities, right? So let's go ahead and evaluate some of these terms here. So coming in. See if I can get my pen to work again here. It's giving me grief. So we've got X in. And X in, we're coming in with 21.3 weight percent. Okay, we need to convert that. So this gives us 0 0.213 over 1 minus 0 0.213. And that gives us 0 0.2706. And that would be essentially kilograms of pyridine over, we're kind of assuming kilograms of water, but a little bit of some other stuff, uh, the, the chlorobenzene in there. Um, X out. We want it to go out with 1.5 weight percent pyridine, right? So 0. 015 over 1 minus 0 0.015 and that gives us 0 0.0152 and let's see y in comes in with 0.4 weight percent so 0 0.004 over 1 minus 0 0.004 And that essentially gives us 0 0.004. Okay. Um, while we're at this, let's go ahead and evaluate, let's say, the diluent flow. How do I get the diluent flow? Diluent here is which component? Water, right? So it's the water. Um, what did we have coming in? We had 120 kilograms, let's say, per hour, something like that. And then what do we do? On the basis that we're working on, we would say that's 1 minus 0 0.213. which gives us 94.44, let's say, kilograms per hour. All right. In the problem, we were given that we had a, um, a system here in which the solvent flow rate is 1.5 times the minimum uh, flow rate. 
So that means we have to calculate the minimum, correct? What do we know about it? Well, I'm going to use this plot. Some of its stuff, some of these stages and so on are already put on here, but let's let's think about where we're starting with right now. We would be starting with this plot. We would have the let's say the equilibrium data plotted on it. Okay? If we so this is this is generally this curve here, right? So we've generally got this this equilibrium data curve. Um, the minimum solvent flow rate is going to occur whenever we hit a pinch point, right? And so that means then that we need to figure out essentially the slope of this line. And we're going to do that by looking at, what, two points, correct? What are the two points that we have? Two points that are on that line would be what? X in, Y out, right? And X out, Y in. Correct? So what do we know already? We already know X out y in, right? We just evaluated those. That's our 0 0.0152, 0 0.004. All right, so that's this point down here, right? Right down here towards the bottom. The second point that we have is we would like to use, say, x in, y out. But is it really y out, or what y out is it? It's y out star, right? It's y out star where we hit the equilibrium line. OK, so we know x in. So we'll say using equilibrium. At x in equals 0 0.2706, what we find is y out star is equal to 0 0.347. So there's our y out. Located right up here. Okay. So with that, then we can go ahead then and we can find the slope. That would be F sub D over F sub S. And that's going to occur when the solvent flow rate is a minimum. Right? Because the solvent flow rate is a minimum, we get the largest slope. OK? Um, and so we can write this as in Y star out minus Y in divided by x in minus x out from our two points. And that's 0 0.347 minus 0 0.004 divided by 0 0.2706 minus 0 0.0152. And that gives us a value here of 1.343. So that means then that we can go ahead and find the minimum solvent flow rate. So the minimum solvent flow rate using this expression which we have here would be F sub D divided by our value, which we just found, so F sub D over 1.343, which is equal to 94.44, let's say kilograms per hour, divided by 1.343. And that we get a value here of 70.32 kilograms per hour. 
Now we can go ahead and evaluate the actual solvent flow rate, right? So we're going to take our 1.5, multiply it by the minimum value, which was a 70.32 kilograms per hour. And that gives us a result of 105.48 kilograms per hour. And that means then that the actual operating line slope, which would be F sub D over F sub S, actual is our 94.44 divided by 105.48, <coughs> which is equal to 0.895. So that gives us our slope that we need. So now we can sketch that in, knowing we have a point down here, slope. Um, once we have that, then it's a matter of we can go ahead and step off stages. Um, stepping off the stages as we would typically do here, looks like we need just a little more than three stages. So we need about 3.25 stages. And the one thing that we should probably evaluate that we would really like to know is um, if we do a mass balance, or we pull it off the plot up here, um, or the plot, we find that y out is equal to 0 0.233. And so from that, we can a obtain the actual weight fraction that's going out, right? So we know that we know that y is equal to little y over 1 minus y. And so if you solve this for little y in terms of big y, you get capital Y over 1 plus capital Y. And so we're doing it for Y out. 0 0.233 over 1 plus 0 0.233 equals, oops, I can't go back with this. Okay. Equals um, 0 0.189. So that would be then the, uh, the weight fraction going out with the, um, in this case, the uh, chlorobenzene. Any questions about what we did? Methodology, general things, so on and so forth. Okay. A couple other things here, and then maybe we'll take a quick look at uh, ChemSup for something. Um, when you have partial miscibility, and it's somewhat significant, it is sometimes possible um, if the combination of the diluent and the solvent in the raffinate might be constant, and in the extract, that combination of the solvent and the diluent might be constant. In those cases, then, you might want to redefine our ratios values um, and just define it in terms of over the, the, the total. And that's essentially what we did in this problem already. One last aspect that I'll mention here. What happens if we do a batch extraction? Like you might do in, say, something like a, maybe a separatory funnel or, or something like that. Um, of course, we could do it on, a, on an actual scale, um, larger scale as well. 
we can do the same kinds of things. Instead of doing rates, now we just use actual masses, right? So we would define some sort of a feed. We would have a raffinate term. We would have an extract term. We'd have a solvent term. We can do a mass balance in this case. Again, not using rates, but using actual masses. Um, so it's going to be the, the feed plus whatever weight fraction of the solutes in that feed. Um, you add to it whatever solvent you're adding plus whatever weight fraction is already in there. And then that's going to be equal to the raffinate that you're going to separate off times weight fraction there plus the extract times the weight fraction there. Um, we get some simplifications when we have immiscible systems. Um, and it's dilute under those conditions and essentially the feed and the raffinate masses are essentially the same. The solvent and the extract masses are essentially the same. Um, in terms of evaluating a system like this, we can even come up with an operating line and so on for it. But it's certainly possible to, to solve these kinds of problems. Questions? Let's, um, I don't know if we have enough time to try this, but let's try this. Why don't we try running something in uh, ChemSep? Okay. We can do liquid-liquid extractions in ChemSep as well. And so what I thought I would sh we could show you is one that we've worked on previously, um, where we made an assumption when we did this problem early on that butanol and water were immiscible. But we know that that's not true. And we know that there's a certain amount of miscibility with this. And so I wanted to revisit this. In fact, maybe before I even show this, let me um, just recall what we looked at. Right here was a phase diagram for this system. Um, given this phase diagram, I, I want us to conceptually think about what's probably does happen in this system, because I'm not sure we can finish up the uh, chemset problem today. Uh, maybe maybe we'll take a look at it Friday just before we jump into 14. Um, so this is this is the fa this is the actual phase diagram for this with some tie lines shown. What do we if you see a phase diagram like this, what does it tell us? Okay, I, I, I will agree with that. There's there's a there's a two phase region in here, right? two liquid phases in here, and then outside of here, we all have single phase, right? Um, if you have, let's say, acetic acid, what's its miscibility with water? Water by itself. Acetic acid with water? It's miscible over the entire range of compositions, isn't it? Because where would you be? You would be essentially along, along here, correct? So acetic acid and water, just those two components, completely miscible with each other. How about butanol and acetic acid? Butanol and acetic acid will be where? Along this one, right? What's true along there? It's always a single phase. So you got complete miscibility along there. How about butanol and water? Butanol and water, depending upon the concentrations, will phase separate, correct? There is a certain amount of miscibility of water in the butanol, right? 
there's a certain miscibility of the butanol in the water, correct? Okay. All right, so let's think about the, the extraction that we did previously, right? We had uh, acetic acid in water, and we were using butanol to pull it out. Okay, that was an example that we did previously. When we did that, we assumed that they were completely immiscible when we solved the problem. Okay. They're really not in this case. So when you start to do this extraction, let's say, right, so we've got water, we've got butanol. Um, when the butanol stream first comes in and hits with whatever water stream is moving along it, what happens? That very first stage, what's going to happen? Or well, that first, first stage where they make the contact with each other? Okay. So, so then what happens? Based upon this diagram, then what's going to happen? You're right, but just... just just take it to its logical conclusion here. You're going to have butanol that wants to go into the water, right? And you're going to have some water that wants to go into the butanol. Okay. Now, once that's happened, we're at very dilute, and when we did this problem, we were pretty dilute concentrations of the acetic acid. As soon as after that's happened, then what happens? Then the flow is going to be fairly constant, right? Extract, raffinate streams are fairly going to be constant. And then at the other end of the column, there's going to be a sudden change as well, right? Because the one end you're bringing, remember, we're coming in counter current, right? For a liquid liquid extraction, right? And so the one end you're coming in with water, essentially, and the other end you're coming in with butanol, essentially, right? I mean, you've got this solid we have to consider. But as soon as those two things happen, you get a dramatic change in exchange of the butanol with the water happening at those points. So conceptually, that's what we would expect to happen. And we can kind of see that um, running ChemSEP. Um, ChemSEP is hard to match up with the equilibrium data here exactly. Um, that's where those thermodynamic models come in and some of the trickiness comes in. Um, it might be worth running one case just to kind of see, but conceptually then you can start to see where all these mass flows come out, which is kind of neat, kind of interesting to see. So we may run that on Friday uh, before we jump into 14. We'll call it a day. All right, any questions? Anything coming up? Test on Wednesday? All right. Well, have a good rest of your day today, and I will get those, those homework solutions out to you.